Hey, 42 here. Adam was but human. He did not want the apple for the apple's sake. He wanted it only because it was forbidden, wrote Mark Twain. And the reason that Adam wanted the apple is the same reason you clicked on this video. Now, I want you to do something for me. Do not think of a white bear for the remainder of this video. Oh, you've already failed, haven't you? The reason you thought about a white bear was the exact same reason you clicked on this video. This same instruction was given to a group of test participants in the 80s. They said to them for the next several minutes, whatever you do, don't think about a white bear. Of course, they all failed too. For the next several minutes, all they could think about was a white bear, no matter how hard they tried not to. Many of them attempted to think of other random scenarios, picturing themselves on holiday, for example, to try to divert their minds. But a white bear always found its way into their thoughts. And before they knew it, they were skydiving in Venezuela with a polar bear. At the end of the study, they all admitted that their attempts to not think of a white bear were entirely futile. Why do our brains have a natural tendency to think of or do the exact opposite of what they're told to? Reverse psychology can be very powerful. Today, the middle and upper classes in Europe eat a diet that consists mainly of kale chips and hummus. But in the 17th century, they ate potatoes. That's right, the humble spot, today a European staple, was for a long time only eaten by the upper classes and royalty. The lower classes were superstitious of the potato, they saw it as bland, tasteless, and many thought it was poisonous. But the upper echelons of society saw the potential of the unassuming brown vegetable and ate it plentifully. During the period of the French Revolutionary Wars, the usual food staples in England, which was at the time basically some variation of a meat pie, was in short supply, and England was on the brink of a famine. So the English government took steps to try to get the English public to eat more potatoes, which were in plentiful supply. They went so far as to hand out pamphlets entitled, Hint Respecting the Culture and Use of Potatoes. But no matter how much they pleaded with the people, they just wouldn't eat potatoes. The same struggle to make potatoes a normal food staple was happening all across the whole of Europe. Eventually, it took someone to do something quite different and not ask people to eat potatoes, but instead to use reverse psychology. Enter Frederick the Great of Prussia. The king of what is now Germany saw great potential in the potato as a way to cheaply feed the nation and not have to rely so heavily on expensive bread. So, in 1774, he issued an order to his subjects to start growing potatoes, to which they replied, the things have neither smell nor taste, not even the dogs will eat them. So what use are they to us? So, he concocted a plan. He planted a grand, royal field of potatoes, and he stationed royal guards to protect the field every day. The local peasants started to grow suspicious. What food could be so valuable that it requires round-the-clock guard protection? And just as Frederick had predicted, within a few days, the local thieves were stealing potatoes from the royal plantation, and selling them at the local market for a high price. Before long, the whole town was eating his royal potatoes. His plan had worked perfectly because he had made them forbidden and told people that they can't have the potatoes. Suddenly, everybody wanted potatoes. And so over the following years, this fondness for potatoes spread across Europe. Whether it's thinking about white bears or eating potatoes, humans love to do what we're told not to do. Children are the ultimate victim of reverse psychology. Tell a kid a hundred times to eat their broccoli and they won't budge. But tell them that they're not allowed any more broccoli and suddenly it's their favourite food. But why can our brains be so easily duped? Why can we not resist pushing the red button? Why do we always want what we can't have, whether it be our neighbour's sports car or wife? 
we even do the opposite of what we tell ourselves to do. When you're about to give a speech to a group of people, and you tell yourself to be calm and not to panic, the complete opposite happens, and you start shaking violently. It seems at times that our brains are just out to get us. Why? Well, we'll find out in a minute, but first, I'd just like to take a minute to thank Skillshare for supporting me on this video. With Skillshare, you can learn hundreds of amazing new skills from the world's leading experts in their fields. Skillshare is an online learning community with over 16,000 classes in design, photo, and so much more. Anyone can take a class, start their next big project, or even teach a class yourself, all at your own pace. You can be a premium member for only $10 per month, and you'll get unlimited access to thousands of amazing classes. The first 500 people to click the link in the description below will get a two-month free trial of Skillshare. I can't recommend this one highly enough, guys. It's the most interesting site you'll ever visit, and who knows what you could learn. Remember, only the first 500 people will get two months free, so click the link in the description now. So, what is the secret behind reverse psychology? Well, it's all because of a thing called reactance. Reactance is the concept that we are all afraid to lose our freedom, and we will do whatever it takes to hang on to it. If our freedom is threatened, for example, if someone takes away our ability to make decisions, we react out of fear. If someone tells us that we can't have fast food anymore, we instantly crave fast food, because we are reacting out of fear of losing our freedom. Reverse psychology works so well because when you threaten to take away somebody's freedom, their natural reaction is to go out of their way to exercise that freedom and prove to you that you're unable to take it away. Just take a look at fair Romeo and Juliet. When they first met, they liked each other, sure. But it was only when both their families forbade them from being together that they fell crazily in love and ended up dying for one another. It is one of the most powerful examples of reverse psychology in literature. But the greatest example of reverse psychology of all time comes from ancient Chinese history. In the greatest book on war ever written, The Art of War, Sun Tzu wrote, Appear weak when you are strong, and strong when you are weak. During the period of the Three Kingdoms in China, around 200 AD, the country's multiple leaders were at war, and one such leader, Chuka Liang, was known as one of the greatest Chinese strategists of all time. During the War of the Three Kingdoms, Chuka Liang was held up in a fort with only a handful of soldiers. When his enemy, Sima Yi, learnt of his location and heard that he had so few men defending his fort, Sima Yi set off with an army of thousands of men to conquer Chuka Liang and take over his fort. But Liang heard about Yi's campaign before he arrived. Instead of bolting all the doors shut and putting what few soldiers he had along the battlements with bows and arrows to defend the fort till the very last man, and then hide away himself, he came up with a plan involving a magnificent feat of reverse psychology. Liang ordered all the doors and gates of the fort to be opened up wide. He ordered the few soldiers that he had to dress up as civilians and to sweep the grounds inside the fort and the roads outside using brooms. Liang then sat calmly atop of the fort, looking out at the approaching army and said not but a word, but melodically played his gukin, an ancient Chinese seven-string plucked instrument. As Yi arrived with his huge army, weapons in hand, he was greeted with open gates, peasants cleaning the streets, not a soldier in sight, and a calm, fearless Liang sat atop his empty fort, still playing his instrument peacefully. Sensing suspicion, Yi instantly thought it was a trap, and that Liang had set up an ambush involving hiding his soldiers in the surrounding hills to circle Yi's army from behind. So instead of simply rushing the fort, Yi quickly ordered his men to retreat with great haste, fearing an imminent ambush. An ambush which, of course, didn't exist. 
And so, using reverse psychology, Liang had quelled an otherwise deadly attack. Liang's incredible strategy has since come to be known as the Empty Fort Strategy, and it made its way into the famous Chinese 36 Stratagems as the 32nd Stratagem. From Chinese Masters of War to modern day advertising, the power of reverse psychology is timeless. Like this advert for the British Army that uses reverse psychology to almost make you feel guilty for not joining the army. And my personal favourite, this advert for a university degree in reverse psychology. But an Amsterdam hotel has perfected the art of reverse psychology in advertising by branding itself as the worst hotel in the world. Hans Brinker Budget Hotel is smack bang in the city centre of Amsterdam and is, by their very own accord, cheap, smelly, cold, not too clean, has absolutely no luxuries and is generally a damn awful place to stay. Online reviews for the hotel include A bus shelter offers the same facilities and What is that smell? I demand to know what that smell is. But instead of trying to improve their standards, they just made these advertising campaigns instead. And this. And this. And, well, would you believe it? It worked! Since releasing these brutally honest ads, the hotel's business is booming. Hans Brinker's 511 beds in 127 rooms are nearly fully occupied all year round. And yes, it's still awful. Reverse psychology has certainly worked out favourably for Hans Brinker, but not so much for another well-known advertiser. Smoking kills, we all know it, even smokers. But addiction is a difficult and emotionally driven problem to overcome. In early 2000, following a treaty signed at the 2003 World Health Assembly in Geneva, it became the law in most countries that cigarette and tobacco packaging had to contain a health warning. Some countries adopted written warnings, whilst others contained highly graphic pictorial warnings. In the following years, many world governments put funds into anti-smoking ads on national television. Such ads are usually highly graphic and usually end in the protagonist either developing cancer or erectile dysfunction. The World Health Organization were pretty pleased with themselves and believed that this visceral new advertising would vastly reduce the number of smokers worldwide by using fear to make them quit. And for a while, the world ignorantly believed that this strategy was working. But what have we learned? That the more times you tell somebody that they can't or shouldn't do something, the more likely they are to do it. And sure enough, multiple recent studies have shown that warning labels on smoking products has absolutely no effect on smoking or quitting rates whatsoever. Moreover, a recent study by experts at Tel Aviv University and New York University concluded that, bizarrely, warning labels on cigarettes, no matter how horrific, actually increase cigarette sales. Researchers showed various packets of cigarettes to test participants. Some had warning labels on, such as smoking kills and smoking causes cancer, etc. And some of the packets had no warnings at all. The participants were asked which packs they would rather purchase from the store, and the vast majority of them chose the packets with warning labels. There's something very interesting going on here. This does have a lot to do with reverse psychology, but there's a lot more to it than that. The researchers also found out that the test participants believed that the brands that put warning labels on their cigarette packages were perceived as more honest and trustworthy. And so, in some strange way, the perceived quality and value of that brand's cigarettes went up in the mind of the participants, so they were more likely to purchase them. Reverse psychology isn't just a mental quirk, it's a tool that many successful people have used, and among them is Freddie Mercury. After Queen recorded Bohemian Rhapsody, a six minute long song 
Every record company they spoke to said it was too long to ever be successful and it would never be played on the radio. So, Freddie Mercury gave a copy of the song to his friend and radio DJ, Kenny Everett, as a gift. But Freddie specifically told him to never play it on air. Of course, Everett did the complete opposite and played the song on air over 14 times in a single radio slot. It was very soon number one in the UK charts and it went on to grace the number one spot once again in 1991 after Mercury's death. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video then don't support this channel on Patreon. Whatever you do, don't hit the subscribe button or watch any more of my videos. And of course, don't you dare click that link in the description to be one of only 500 people to get a 2 month free trial on Skillshare.